West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Hutchinson had previously interned for the House Minority Whip Steve Scalise and the Texas Senator Ted Cruz before she landed in the Trump White House. According to the Washington Post, many former Trump advisors were stunned to see Hutchinson testifying. As a fiercely loyal aide to Meadows, some believed she would defend him no matter what. For others, she was quite literally the last person that former Trump advisors expected to see testifying against their former boss in this investigation. One former White House official told the Post, quote, she was totally enthusiastic about Trump and working in that White House, end quote. So the fact that Cassidy Hutchinson decided to testify publicly before the committee is in itself notable. And the fact that she did so despite being warned not to do so by Trump allies is also interesting. According to Punchbowl News, at least one of the two potential witnesses tampering, uh, uh, potential witness tampering messages presented by investigators yesterday was sent to Hutchinson. And because those close to Trump couldn't dissuade her from providing her damning account of what she saw in the White House, people in Trump world are now attempting to cast doubt over her testimony, specifically her recollection of what another White House aide told her about the former president lunging at a Secret Service agent in an attempt to take the steering wheel and head to the Capitol on January the 6th. Today, Hutchinson's lawyers tell MSNBC that she stands by her account, but whether or not Trump did throw a fit over not being driven to the Capitol is actually largely beside the point compared to her testimony that Donald Trump desperately wanted to march and lead a mob that he knew was armed to the Capitol. Joining us now is the California Congresswoman and member of the January 6th investigation, Zoe Lofgren. Congresswoman, thank you for being with us uh, this evening. Cassidy Hutchinson tonight is standing by her testimony as sources who are close to Tony Ornato and the Secret Service claim that Ornato and Bobby Engel, the Secret Service agent whom Trump allegedly lunged at, would testify under oath that what Hutchinson testified about did not happen. What do you make of those claims and the effort to cast doubt on uh, Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony? Well, her testimony under oath wasn't about what happened because she wasn't there. It was that Mr. Onato told her that and that uh, Mr. Engel was present and didn't deny it. So we'll see if they want to come in under oath and deny that, fine. Um, the real point is no one is denying that the former president wanted to go to the Capitol and lead this armed mob uh, and be there while they attack the Capitol. That's the point. And it's um, no one can deny it. I mean, that she actually heard the president himself talk about 
removing the effing mags and that the armed uh, supporters were not going to hurt him, that they could march from the ellipse to the Capitol is stunning and the most important revelation, really, I think, of all the things she testified to. One of the um, Punchbowl News reported today that Hutchinson was one of the witnesses who was sent a message described by uh, Vice Chair of the Committee, Liz Cheney, as potential witness tampering. Now, on that issue, you said something tonight in another TV interview that I want to ask you about. You said, quote, in a prior hearing, we talked about the hundreds of millions of dollars that the former president raised. Some of that money is being used to pay for lawyers for witnesses. And it's not clear that that arrangement is one that is without coercion uh, potential for some of those witnesses. What I want to ask you to elaborate on that. What did you mean by that? Well, I mean, we know that uh, large amounts of money have been spent out of the uh, the fund that was uh, uh, amassed by the former president and is being uh, used to pay for lawyers to various witnesses. Um, the potential for coercion in that case is pretty obvious. Um, I'm not going to comment on which witness those uh, threatening uh, messages were sent to, but obviously if you read them, there's an intent to uh, dissuade a witness from testifying honestly. So this is a concern. And I just want uh, people who would try and interfere with a witness, who would coerce them or threaten them to know that that's not legal. And we do not intend to just sit by and watch that happen. Well, let's explore that a little bit. Uh, are, are you worried that the backlash that uh, Cassidy Hutchinson is now facing by her former colleagues and the supporters of the former president, that that may influence uh, other witnesses and make them hesitant to come forward? And, and when you say we're not going to allow that to happen, what what can you actually offer? All, all I'm saying is, I mean, certainly Miss Hutchinson, although she's young, is uh, pretty wise. She knew and we knew that when she testified, Trump loyalists would try and undercut her testimony, attack her, belittle her, and try and um, you know discount her, her testimony under oath. And in fact, that's what's happening right now. Um, but as to witness intimidation, that's a crime. Mm -hmm. and, and if individuals who are trying to protect the president are committing a crime, we intend to take the evidence that we get of that and, uh, and not just sit on it. Uh, people ought to be aware that committing the crime of witness tampering is a serious matter and it's not going to be ignored. As a lawyer, you know a lot about uh, crimes, and I guess there are people involved in January 6th who may have been lawyers, may not have known about things. Pat Cipollone was a lawyer, is a lawyer, uh, and a lot of information about him came out in yesterday's hearing. You have spoken to him uh, uh, on the committee at some point, but at this point you are asking, in fact this evening, you have issued a subpoena. You want more information from him under oath. Tell me about that. Well, pretty clearly, if you watched the hearing yesterday with Ms. Hutchinson, he was uh, relaying information to people other than the president, and we need to talk to him about it. There have been some informal discussions, um, but not the, f the fulsome discussion that we need. We respect that there are some elements of the advice he gave directly to the president that may be subject to privilege. So, uh, you know, respecting that, we'll work through those issues. But clearly, some of what he said and did did not fall into that category, and we need to talk to him, and we hope he comes in promptly. It is Thursday, the 30th of June of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Now you know it's just a little bit of jambalaya. Just a little bit of spice in your life. Speaking of spice, uh, do you like clean air? I know I've... I've uh, gone on and on and on about this before, but do you like clean air? 
And how about some clean water to drink? Let alone bathe in. How about some clean water to, I don't know, wet your palate? Well, if you like that, if you love it, if you think it's a necessity, well, I got I, I got some info for you. Uh, you're going to be sorely disappointed <laughs> because, now, granted, we have put ourselves in a bubble here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy so that we can do this show. Otherwise, uh, we would be inundated with well, all the news that just keeps cascading down upon us. But it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that the Supreme Court will overturn the ability of federal regulatory agencies to regulate business or really anything that the right wing says that we don't want those liberal commies doing. And they seem to be getting away with it. Do you get how quickly these decisions are the, 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 the decision to push these cases forward so quickly? Oh my God. And, and uh, I guess they've conquered the Cherokee finally. Yeah, they drove him to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears and said, you stay here until we can figure out what to do with you. And then all these people start whining, not not the Cherokee who got driven there or any other Indian group that got caught up in it, because it wasn't just the Cherokee, mind you. I'm talking about, uh, you know, the settlers. They started whining, oh, it's like a big old Indian reservation. Why, 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 why? It's they're treating it like their own nation. Yeah, that's the treaty, Mofo. Well, Supreme Court decided that nope, you're in the state of Oklahoma, so you gotta follow Oklahoma laws. You little people. Why don't you just admit that you're conked? Get it over with. Next thing you know, they're going to start putting them in uh, schools again, cutting their hair, telling them they can't use their Indian names. Oh, you can't learn about your heritage. But you got to learn about the heritage of whatever it is the white nationalist bigot Nazis say that it is. I don't know where they, they, they talk about. I don't know, Teutonic and all that? I, I, you know, sort of Germanic. The Aryan is really uh, not from that part of the world. Just letting you know. How about Persia? Wait until they find out. Okay, well, uh, let's see. We've got forced birth. We've got uh, only Christians can pray. And they're going to force everybody else to do it or else you don't get to play. Pray to play. In fact, we have a story about that today, except it's, uh, you know, you got to pray to get paid. <laughs> yeah, pray to pay. What? And, uh, yeah, so we got that. We have uh, Indian sovereignty out the window. Goodbye. Too bad. I guess... I, I think I didn't read the opinion or because on on the uh, the uh, Huerta decision about Indian sovereignty. <laughs> I need more coffee. Do I? So uh, but I suspect I suspect that it probably hinges on uh, what is traditional in our form of government and what is has a lot of tradition and it's pretty much imbued in the constitution itself is that <laughs> the indigenous people on this continent don't matter what the hell are we thinking about them for they're in the way we're gonna cut a swath from sea to shining sea well, let's get rid of their food source and give them a bunch of blankets and uh, embedded with the disease, pestilence, and whatever. And uh, that was a genocide, folks. On a 
continent-wide scale. We did that. And uh, I know some people will say, well, what do you mean we, white man? But that's what I'm, I'm talking to, you know, my fellow uh, lighter-skinned individuals, at least in temperament. Ah, oh, boy. Clarence and Jenny Thomas getting into get into an RV and ride around America meeting people, and a lot of people don't recognize them as who they are. But, you know, when you're, when you're like uh, criminals on the lam, maybe they're just getting, you know, getting practice, rehearsing. Apparently they blend. Mm-hmm. Well, if, ter- if Thomas gets his... If, or Clarence. If Clarence gets... Because which Thomas? If Clarence gets his wish, uh, maybe he didn't want to be married to Ginny all along. <laughs> because when loving V. Virginia gets overturned, I don't know. Maybe this is the only way he figured he could unburden himself from. Well, Ginny, he's been getting. She's been getting on his nerves a little bit. I bet. How much more do I have to do to protect this woman? I can't take it anymore. Actually, I think he can take it a lot more. You know, uh, uh, Brown Jackson uh, will be uh, sworn in at the end of the show. Just letting you know. Or towards the end. At the top of the hour at the end of the show. Because sometimes, you know, the music and everything goes a little over. Sometimes. And uh, I was actually thinking, you know what? There's no stare decisis on the Supreme Court anymore, stare decisis. There's no precedent on the Supreme Court anymore. They've come right out and said it's out the window, mofo, and they laugh at us. Well, if that's the case, why don't we convince Breyer to stay on the court, swear in uh, Brown Jackson, and then just smile when... The maggots start going crazy and their heads start exploding. Just smile wanly. Okay. That's my suggestion. No one's going to take it, even though my middle name is Justice. And that's the truth. Well, 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 we do have a more curated show for you. Was that rehearsed, what I just did? Nah, maybe it's off the top of my head. Maybe it's not. Uh, We take notes, and sometimes we stay with the notes, and sometimes we don't. But this part of the show, we do. We we stay with the notes. And what are those notes in this curated part of the show here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fine Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays? Well, yes, uh, some experts might think paying the lawyer fees for the J6 committee witnesses and sending threats to those who sought their own counsel might be coercion and witness intimidation. You know, it just might. On the rest of the menu, anti-abortion lawmakers want to block patients from crossing state lines by using the Texas vigilante law. That's great. Give everybody a gun and then put them out on the roads to pull over anybody as a pregnant woman or anybody they suspect of wanting to cross state lines for anything. I call that the Stasi Quo. Two North Carolina workers filed suit against an employer who fired them for not participating in the company's daily Christian prayer circle meetings. And it was mandatory. And I'm pretty sure if it goes to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court will say, well, it was mandatory. And Rhode Island has set an ambitious target for 100% renewable energy by 2033. Yeah, wait until the oil companies find out. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where New Zealand has joined Canada in designating American far-right group The Proud Boys as a terrorist organization. You know, the same ones that were the Praetorian Guard for Trump. And a Mexican journalist was shot to death in the northeastern part of the country. The 12th journalist killed in the nation so far this year. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link. And, of course, the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, who will be at Netroots Nation in Pittsburgh this year. Don't catch any diseases, folks. Okay? Take all the precautions. I know everybody will. But uh, it's been a little bit of time be- since we've had some in-person uh, Netroots Nation confabs. They've been virtual for a bit. So we're looking forward to Kelly Lincoln being in Pittsburgh for Netroots Radio, getting all the interviews and everything else. So thank you, Kelly. If you would look across the page of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the left from the chat room link, there is the link to our Patreon site. And thank you to those of you who have recently begun becoming or have begun your patronage (laughs) of Netroots Radio. It's not just West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. It's the whole station, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, what we do here is uh, we, though it seems rather jocular, we do take it quite seriously and uh, have been for the last 11 years. And we have folks like you to thank for allowing us to pay our bills and allowing us. Well, you've helped us a lot because every bit helps us pay our bills. And then we found that when that simple act allows us to fly under the radar and continue This powerhouse of resistance against dark forces arrayed against not only the United States of America, but representative democracy around the world. And that is no joke. But thank you for your generosity. And we will continue doing this as the founders originally intended so many years ago. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Hey, and thank you, Tom, for figuring out those uh, migrating droplets that uh, kicked David's show off the air the other day. Yeah, service provider, just as a reminder, one of our service providers had an emergency, what they call a droplet migration that they had to conduct, and it affected specific streams that we carry here at Netroots Radio, and it affected others too, but we were given a notice too late to do anything about it, especially since my tech know-how doesn't know it, know how to do anything. Yikes! But thankfully, Tom does, and thank you, Tom, for figuring that out and getting it fixed. If you would like to follow me on Twitter, I, I would suggest you do because... Why? Why follow me at Justice Putnam on Twitter? I'll tell you why. Because I post the show notes and links diary. Yes, it will be a diary, not a story. I'm old school that way. Anyway, that gets uh, posted 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, generally, those show notes and links get posted up on Twitter and other social media platforms sometimes during the opening clip. But uh, that's how it goes. Anyway, if you follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam, you can get to my Daily Co's page and find those show notes and links for any particular show you would be interested in. And as a reminder, you know that the show notes and links is where the real reportage can be found without the embellishment that we're known for here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and Pick Up Podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes. Really, wherever podcasts can be found. I don't know if we're on Audible yet. Amazon's been a little slow on uh, approving West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Maybe because we're pro-union. Maybe. Anyway, you can find us most everywhere. And, of course, you can also get the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library at the Internet Archive at archive.org. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, because there's a chef's table, too. All right. Little amuse-bouche to end it up. I know, usually the amuse-bouche is at the beginning, but we do things differently here in America, don't we? Yes, we do. Anyway, save a little room for your amuse-bouche at the chef's table. But 
as we begin here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Caroline Kitchener and Devlin Barrett of the Washington Post bring us this first offering. Several national anti-abortion groups and their allies in Republican-led state legislatures are advancing plans to stop people in states where abortion is banned from seeking the procedure elsewhere, according to people involved in the discussions. The idea has gained momentum in some corners of the anti-abortion movement in the days since the Supreme Court struck down its nearly 50-year-old president, protecting abortion rights nationwide, triggering abortion bans across much of the Southeast and Midwest. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. It's almost like all the old slave states. The Thomas More Society, oh them, a conservative legal organization, is drafting model legislation because generally these dim-witted southern racist midwestern right I'm sorry. Should we make it so regional? Let's just put it this way. The maggot legislator doesn't know how to legislate. And the Tea Party legislator didn't know how to legislate. And the Freedom Caucus legislators don't know how to legislate, but they know who does. Now, those are private shops set up as think tanks that write, quote, model legislation that all the legislator has to do is plug it in, sign their name. We're now going to have to call it coup in a box. It used to be legislation in a box. Now it is coup in a box. Well, the Thomas More Society is drafting model legislation for state lawmakers that would allow private citizens to sue anyone who helps a resident of a state that has banned abortion from terminating a pregnancy outside of that state. The draft language will borrow from the novel legal strategy behind a Texas abortion ban enacted last year in which private citizens, I might add, armed private citizens, were empowered to enforce the law through civil litigation. And the best way to serve a summons is to bring all your guns. Patricia Beecham of the Washington Post brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Two North Carolina workers allege they were fired for not participating in daily company prayer sessions. According to a lawsuit filed by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, John McGaha and Mackenzie Saunders claim that their former employer, Aurora Pro Services in Greensboro created a hostile work environment because they refused to attend mandatory Christian-based prayer meetings. The lawsuit comes after the Supreme Court ruled in favor of a former high school football coach who was dis disciplined by a Washington State school board for praying at midfield after a football game, a decision some religious liberties advocates hail as a victory for freedom of religious expression. Just try that with toddlers and dressed up like a Hare Krishna. It would never work. The 50-yard line at a football game? Give me a break. Well, the EEOC lawsuit filed in the U.S. District Court in Greensboro says Aurora Pro Services, which has between 11 and 50 employees, did not provide religious accommodation for the two non-Christian plaintiffs, discriminatorily discharged them, and punitively diminished Magaha's wages. Aurora Pro Services did not respond to a request for comment. I bet they're preying on it, though. 
The EEOC alleges that Aurora Pro Services, which provides residential contract services such as roofing, plumbing, and heating, demanded that its employees stand in a circle for a prayer as the owner read scriptures and Bible verses. After McGaw asked if he could avoid the activity while Saunders skipped them entirely, they were fired even though they had satisfactory job performances, the complaint states. Session participants would sometimes request prayers for poor-performing employees and business matters woven within biblical text and references, according to the lawsuit. McGaha, who worked for the company from June to September of 2020 as a construction manager, Notice that the length of the prayer meetings increased from about 20 minutes to 45 minutes or more as time passed. He attended the prayers, prayer circles shortly after starting the job, but began to find them intolerable because of how religious they became. That usually happens with prayers in the Christian vein. In late August of 2020, Magaha asked the owner if he could exclude himself from the daily prayers because they were conflicting with his own beliefs of atheism. But his request was met with a response that it would be in his best interest to attend. He made the same request a few weeks later, only to be told that his feelings and beliefs about the prayer meetings did not matter and that his presence was mandatory. Now, according to the lawsuit, at one prayer circle meeting, the owner told Magaha in front of the other employees, if you do not participate, that is okay. You don't have to work here. You are getting paid to be here. Now, this is the part where I think the Supreme Court, in its current construct, will, will rule in favor of the employer because if you're getting paid, you are no longer a human being, mofo. You're a cog in someone else's machine. But you do have a choice not to be a cog in that machine. Goodbye. Jennifer McDermott of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Rhode Island's governor signed legislation yesterday, Wednesday, setting the most ambitious target in the nation to require the state to be powered completely by renewable energy. The legislation accelerates plans for the electric grid to operate with 100% renewable energy, so the goal is achieved in 2033. It is the most ambitious timeline in the country. My state of Oregon is the next closest state with legislation that requires retail electricity providers to reduce emissions by 100 percent by 2040. And that's according to the National Conference of State Legislatures. There are currently 10 states with a 100% renewable portfolio standard or clean energy standard with most timelines between 2040 and 2050. Democratic Governor Dan McKee signed the bill at a solar farm in North Providence that was built at the site of the former municipal landfill. McKee said the state has momentum on clean en energy and an opportunity ahead of us like we've never seen before. The renewable energy legislation was championed in the state Senate by Senate President 
Dominic Ruggiero, a North Providence Democrat. It states that all of the energy provided to Rhode Island by 2033 would come through renewable energy, either directly from renewable energy resources or, uh uh-oh, through offsets in the regional market. Well, I guess I got to start somewhere. Let us now start by going to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Hi, and welcome to COVID Quickly, a Scientific American podcast series. This is your fast track update on the COVID pandemic. We bring you up to speed on the science behind the most urgent questions about the virus and the disease. We demystify the research and help you understand what it really means. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. And we're Scientific American's senior health editors. Today, we're looking at COVID vaccines for the littlest kids, finally, and reasons for getting them. And why vaccines, paradoxically, are making it harder to make new antiviral medicines. At long last, Tanya, kids under five years old are eligible for COVID vaccines. Can you bring us up to speed on what's happened? Earlier this month, the FDA authorized the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for children six months through four or five years old, respectively. The decision came after an FDA advisory panel voted that the benefits of the shots outweighed the risks for these youngest children. The CDC's own advisory panel also recommended the shots and parents can now start to get their children vaccinated at doctor's offices and other sites around the country. The vaccines for adults got authorized more than a year ago. Why has it taken so long for little kids? Well, Josh, you always have to be careful testing any new vaccine or drug in children. And the risk of severe COVID is greatest in older adults, so vaccine makers started by testing vaccines in that group first, then worked their way down to teenagers, then older kids, and finally kids under five. That makes sense. But kids can still get very sick with COVID, right? That's right. Even though the absolute risk of children getting severely ill from COVID is low, more than 440 children under five have died from the virus in the U.S., and many more have been hospitalized, especially during the recent Omicron waves. Children can also develop a condition called MIS-C, which causes inflammation in organs, including the lungs, heart, kidneys, and brain, and they can get long COVID. So young kids are not invulnerable. What do we know about the safety of the vaccines? Both Pfizer and Moderna used a smaller dose of their vaccines for little kids. Pfizer's was three shots, each one-tenth of its adult dose, and Moderna's was two shots, one quarter of an adult dose. The side effects in the clinical trials were similar to those seen in older kids and adults. Pain and redness at the injection site, headache, fatigue, irritability, and fever. Fever is a concern with babies and small children because it can sometimes trigger seizures. Some of the kids in the trials developed fevers, and a handful had seizures, but the seizures were not thought to be related to the vaccine. There were also no cases of myocarditis or pericarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle or its lining. In rare cases, older children, mostly teenage boys or young men, developed this complication after vaccination, but it was generally mild and resolved on its own. There were no deaths of young kids in the trials. That's definitely encouraging. What about the vaccine's efficacy? That's a harder thing to measure, but we know that both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines met the FDA's threshold for immune response. In other words, the levels of neutralizing antibodies produced in response to vaccination matched those of older kids or young adults. In terms of protection against COVID itself, the numbers of children who got COVID in the trials were so low that it's hard to draw strong conclusions. But Pfizer's three-dose vaccine appeared to have an efficacy of 75.6% in 6- to 23-month-olds and 82.4% in 2- to 4-year-olds. Moderna's two-dose vaccine had an efficacy of 50.6% in children aged 6-23 through months 
and 36.8% among those aged two through five years. Why was the efficacy so much lower than what we saw in adults and older kids when those trials were conducted? Well, the vaccine trials for different age groups took place when different variants of the SARS-CoV-2 virus were circulating. The trial of kids under five occurred during the first wave of Omicron, which is known to be better at evading our immune response. So it's a bit like comparing apples and oranges. That said, vaccine makers are currently testing newer formulations of the vaccines that target Omicron specifically, and those appear to be more effective at preventing symptomatic disease. In general, the current vaccines provide good protection against severe disease, especially with the booster shots. So how are parents reacting now that the vaccine is actually here? I spoke with a bunch of parents here in Brooklyn, New York, as well as in a few other cities, and the main feeling was relief. Some were frustrated. They said it had taken too long. Others were glad that the testing had been thorough. Still, many parents across the country are less thrilled about the prospect survey show. Only about one in five parents said they're eager to get their child vaccinated right away, according to a Kaiser Family Foundation poll. But two and a half years into the pandemic, the vaccine is finally available to pretty much everyone in the country who wants it. Vaccines have saved countless lives, but their success is now making it harder to develop COVID treatments. That's kind of odd, isn't it? It is a bit hard to wrap your head around, Tanya, but yes. All the shots in arms and some other factors are slowing down trials of drugs that people can take if they get COVID. These are drugs like Paxlovid to keep the disease from getting severe. Basically, you want to test a drug on a group of people at risk for severe problems. But as more people get vaccinated, fewer people are at high risk, so it's hard to find enough of them to test the drug. Wow. Is that really happening? It is. Here's an example from Brazil. Nature News reported on a trial of drugs in that country to prevent serious disease and hospitalizations. It began in 2020, and 16% of people later had to be hospitalized or died. It was easier to see if adding certain drugs could lower that number. But in 2021, vaccines had been rolled out, and the percentage of hospitalizations and deaths dropped to about 3 to 5%. That low number made it hard to find enough at-risk people and see if the drugs had beneficial effects. To get more people into the trial, the researchers had to expand it to several other countries, and that slowed down testing a lot. But we already have drugs that treat the disease, so what's the urgency to find more? Well, we only have about a half dozen, and some of them, such as monoclonal antibodies, are fluids that have to be infused or injected into your body, so they're hard to use in poorer countries without a lot of medical clinics. Plus, many of these antibodies have lost effectiveness against new variants. Even the new pill, Paxlovid, has limits. It's good in people who are elderly or who have other risk factors. But tests haven't shown a strong benefit for younger people, and they get seriously ill too, so we need treatments for them. There are also people whose symptoms have rebounded after they finished a course of Paxlovid. The symptoms aren't worse than the original bout of the disease, and people did eventually get better. But an improved drug could eliminate the rebound. Some doctors think the rebound occurs when Paxlovid doesn't reach all of the pockets of virus that are hiding in your body. It sounds like we shouldn't expect a rush of new drugs. We probably shouldn't. But we shouldn't be too pessimistic either. Researchers have been creative about combining trial groups from different countries to get enough people into a study. And the existing success of some drugs gives scientists paths to explore further with new ones. But it is, like everything else in the pandemic, going to take some time. Now you're up to speed. Thanks for joining us. Our show is edited by Jeff Del Vicio and Tuliga Bose. Come back in two weeks for the next episode of COVID Quickly. And check out Siam.com for updated and in-depth COVID news. Don't you wish your life came with a warning app? Stop. That dog does not want to be petted. (laughs) A heads up before something bad happens. You should not send that text. Uh Uh-oh. 
Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome, but prediabetes does. With early diagnosis and a few healthy changes, you can reverse prediabetes and prevent or delay type 2 diabetes. To learn your risk, take the one-minute test today at doihadprediabetes.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its prediabetes awareness partners. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Too many big business CEOs turn out to be grifters, ripping off consumers, workers, and others. But the corporate con artists I consider most vile are those who profiteer on people's health care needs. We've had such infamous high-profile scammers as Medicare fraudster Rick Scott, Big Pharma price gouger Martin Shkreli, and the Sackler family of opioid pushers. Worse, though, we now face an industry-wide epidemic of insurers, hospitals, and others that are pushing higher costs onto patients, then systematically pushing those who can't pay the full inflated tab into debt schemes. With bloated interest charges, payments go on for years, and medical bankruptcies are soaring. The most significant statistic in today's avaricious world of health care finance is this. Half of U.S. adults don't have the money to cover a $500 medical bill. Thus, as the system keeps jacking up its prices and profits, millions of families are forced by illness or injury into the dark valley of debt, inhabited by ruthless debt collectors employed by the medical establishment. But wait, you say, I have health insurance. Still, ever-increasing prices and out-of-pocket insurance requirements push you into debt, too. A recent Kaiser Family Foundation survey found that 6 out of 10 working-class adults with health coverage went into medical debt in the past five years. Most perversely, health care debt prevents many people from getting health care. One in seven Americans say the corporate system has refused care to them because they have unpaid medical bills and two-thirds say they've put off care because of the fear of crushing debt. As one expert puts it, the number one reason and the number two and three and four reasons that people go into medical debt is that they don't have the money. It's not complicated. This is Jim Hightower saying, to help stop healthcare industry's profiteers, go to ripmedicaldebt.org. Howdy ho, folks. Thanks for tuning in and sharing my weekly commentaries. Also, please join me for a live web show I host every other Tuesday, the Hightower Lowdown Happy Hour at the Chat and Chew Cafe. You can join the action live online as I chat with grassroots leaders and progressive sparklies from around the country. Go to hightowerlowdown.org slash chat and chew to find out about upcoming guests and watch past episodes. That's hightowerlowdown.org slash chat and chew. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1998. If you were trying to drive to work on that Tuesday morning in Midtown Manhattan, you were probably late. 40,000 construction workers took to the streets in a massive protest. They shut down more than 200 building projects. They were rallying against the use of non-union labor. The New York Daily News declared Midtown shutdown and pending projects hammered by protests. The New York Post's front page headline was Midtown Mayhem. The protest snarled traffic outside of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority on Madison Avenue. The MTA had awarded a $33 million dollar contract to build a subway command center to a non-union employer, Roy K. Incorporated. The construction workers chose to hold their demonstration during rush hour to make the most impact. One organizer explained, we wanted to make the biggest statement possible. The workers chanted, what do we want? Union. When do we want it? Now. Some of the protesters decided to march to the job site. 
At 10th Avenue, they were met by police in riot gear and police on horseback. One protester estimated that there were 2,000 police officers, including snipers on rooftops. Up to that point, the protest had been relatively peaceful. But then the police demanded the protesters disperse and began to spray mace into the crowd of construction workers and supporters. One protester was kicked in the head by a horse. Numerous police and protesters went to the hospital for injuries and exposure to the police mace. 38 people were round up and arrested. After the protest, small pickets against the MTA project continued. But the non-union contractor, who had the power of New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani's police force to back them up, would not be moved. Labor History in Two, brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 60 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high in the low 90s, winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour, cleared up partly cloudy overnight with lows in the mid-50s, winds out of the northwest. At 5 to 10 miles per hour, some clouds in the morning will give way to mainly sunny skies in the afternoon tomorrow, and we're expecting highs in the upper 80s to low 90s with winds remaining out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Also, our forecast for rain on Sunday has now been forecast to come in on Saturday which we will consider a very good thing. And, <clears throat> pardon me, we may have rain also on Sunday. Any amount will be, uh, we'll, 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 we'll take it. Yeah, we will. We want it. We need it. It gets hot here. And considering that people are going to be, in spite of the fact that there was a devastating house fire that forced a family out of their home, burned their house to the ground and started a four-acre grass fire that was fortunately put down. People are still going to fire off illegal fireworks here right at those grasslands that just about caught on fire. Oh, my God. Let alone the poor house. So be safe and sane, folks. Safe and sane. We do have an update on confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon. Our confirmed cases have increased by quite a bit. We are now at 466,049. And our deceased have increased by almost a dozen at 554. Now, of course, these are updates for many, many days, not a daily total. Uh, but this is in spite of the fact that people, once again, are home testing and not reporting their infections when they test positive. Grass pollen is rated high right outside the window here in Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is good at 25 parts per million and that daytime UV index is very high at level 9. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.06 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 78%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 68 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 62 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 94 and fair. Kiev is 84 and sunny. Kabul is 82 and clear. Hong Kong is 82 with a light rain shower. Tokyo is 83 and fair. 
Sydney, Australia is 52 and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 52 and cloudy. And New York, New York is 82 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here in the chef's table at West Coast, cookbook and speakeasy. New Zealand's government has declared that American far-right groups The Proud Boys and The Base are terrorist organizations. The two groups join 18 others, including Islamic State, that have been given an official terrorist designation, making it illegal in New Zealand to fund, recruit, or participate in the group's and obligating authorities to take action against them. The U.S. groups are not known to be active in New Zealand, although the South Pacific nation has become more attuned to threats from the far right after a white supremacist shot and killed 51 Muslim worshippers at two Christchurch mosques in 2019. The New Zealand massacre inspired other white supremacists from around the world, including a white gunman who killed 10 black people at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York. In the U.S., the State Department only lists foreign groups as terrorist entities, but the Proud Boys were last year named a terrorist group in Canada, while the base has previously been declared a terrorist group in Britain, Canada, and Australia. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Associated Press staff bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A journalist was shot to death yesterday, Wednesday, in northeastern Mexico as he was leaving his house with his 23-year-old daughter who was seriously injured. Antonio de la Cruz, age 47, was a reporter for the local newspaper Expresso for almost three decades. His death brings to 12, the number of journalists killed this year in the country, the deadliest for the Mexican press. De La Cruz was shot at the door of his home in Ciudad Victoria, capital of the state of Tamaulipas, on the U.S. border. The region is mired in violence linked to organized crime. Expresso covers all kinds of news in the city, including security issues. De La Cruz reported on rural and social topics such as water shortages. Expresso has been targeted over the years. In 2012, one of the worst years of drug cartel violence, a car bomb exploded in front of the newspaper's building. In 2018, a cooler with a human head inside was left at the newspaper with a warning not to report on violence in the city. The governor of the region promised an investigation of the killing so that this cowardly crime does not go unpunished, he said. The state prosecutor's office said that the specialized unit for investigating crimes against freedom of expression had been informed. The federal prosecutor's office said it was opening an investigation. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on and 
we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coel Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver, dans mon jardin d'hiver, dans mon jardin d'hiver, dans mon jardin d'hiver.